Okay, lectures, lecture part one, lecture one, part A, in which we look at public policy, nutrition, and health. Um, so welcome to the first part of the first lecture proper on the nutrition and health module. It's intended as a general introduction to some key issues, which we'll do in more detail, both in this module and throughout the course. There are a number of tutorial activities associated with, associated with each lecture, highlighted in red, uh, and you need to do them before we meet either in person or physically, or uh, virtually rather. Uh, this is where the opening lectures fit in the overall framework, and we bring me and uh, Laura and Kelly will bring in other stuff associated with this as we go through the module. As you learn more about nutrition and health, you'll often come across the term intervention. This refers to some policy or actions that are intended to improve the health of a population. Uh, whether they do not improve the health, do or do not improve the health of the population is another question and a key issue in public health generally, which we'll also address in considerable detail. Examples of public health interventions include five a day, the balance of good health, formerly known as the Eat Well Plate, and traffic light labour on the front of food packs. We'll look at these and other interventions during this module and throughout the rest of the course. Okay, so an introduction to the role of government. Um, this article, which is linked through the image over here and also is in the, uh, also probably in Blackboard as well, and as usual, uh, it, it's also linked in the notes for these for this presentation. Uh, so the article is not structured like a standard paper, but as the sections listed above. For now, we're mostly concerned with broad definitions the authors use. You can, of course, read the paper. If you want to know more detail about the specific issues involved, and say click on the image or use the link that's in the notes. Um, this is the author's analysis of influences on food choices. Uh, now, don't worry, there's a lot of it. Uh, we're going to be using this now and again to look at where a particular intervention or a particular approach fits into the overall big picture of factors that influence food choice. Uh, they also suggest that we should be considered when governments think about how to influence people's behaviour with respect to food choices. Uh, other authors may take a slightly different approach, but the same broad principles are likely to apply. Don't worry if you see a paper or book which looks different to this, just try to understand what basic principles are being applied. Global factors such as climate change and international trade agreements have the potential impact on large numbers of people. The current coronavirus price crisis is also likely to have a significant impact in ways that aren't yet clear. We'll return to influences later, but for now we'll look at a classification of policy interventions. Okay, this is modified a little bit from the original paper for clarity. Some of the language here is a little bit technical, for example, domain. Here it means an area where action can be taken. For example, by producing point of sale information on food. So what the nutritional content of a sandwich you're buying is. Domain factors are big scale. National dietary guidelines and food standards most obviously. As we'll see for labelling in food, in terms of nutritional information and issues such as use by date are legally required. Further information such as traffic light labelling of key nutrients associated with health gives the supplier more flexibility, but is clearly welcomed by many consumers. Bear in mind, however, that a lot of people pay little or no attention to these details. Um, we'll revisit this idea later, but now we'll just have a review of some well-known examples of policy interventions. Here's one example. Uh, the information here is legally required. It's obviously about nutrition, but there's Mostly, but there is other information that's required on prepackaged food. Uh, meals in restaurants don't currently need this information. Uh, where they should is a controversial issue. What do you think? More on that in a moment, I think. Uh, the packaging and labelling image leads to resource for the Food Standards Agency about prepackaged food. Now, the FSA is a key resource for issues about food safety and quality, so it should be in one of your bookmarks. Uh, you'll often want to look in there to find out what the national situation is and what our national position is. Uh, the second link, uh, label of non-prepackaged food, is a business guide. Uh, obviously takes a business perspective and still well worth having a look at. Uh, we're mostly concerned with nutrition here, but a quick review of labels and especially how they relate to food safety is needed. 
Food labels for prepackaged food must have the information on this in the next slide. Uh, before advancing the slides, have a think about what food allergens you are aware of and why they're important and also what is meant by the date of minimal, minimum durability. In the notes it says data, but that should be date. Look at the prepackaged food in your cupboard or fridge. You should be able to find all of this information. It is legally required. These are the main food allergens. An allergen is a substance that causes an allergic reaction. In some cases, this can be relatively mild, if distressing and often inconvenient. For others, the aller allergic reaction can be potentially or actually fatal. Again, for more information, click on the link, uh, the image, Allergen Guidance for Food Business, to take you to some FSA guidance. Um, Pritamanja was involved in two allergen-related deaths in 2018. In neither case was allergen information offered to customers. Pret changed its policies after the second death, and UK legislation will require allergen labelling, but not until the 21st of October 2021. Hopefully that won't be, be delayed even more by the current situation. Now if you want to know more about the stories, if you click on them, we'll take you to some news articles on them. Um, the traffic light system was introduced in 2014. It was designed to give consumers a, a, way of, a, a simple way of seeing how much the most important nutrients and energy a particular food contains. Green here indicates a low amount. We reflect to the refre reference intake for an adult. Uh, more on reference intakes later. Red indicates a high value, with oranges sort of like in the middle, a medium amount. Um, the reference daily intake is a maximum amount of energy or nutrients an average adult should consume every day. So in the NHS link for information. Uh, the average value is for a woman. The value of kilocalories for men is 2,500. Note that protein isn't involved in the traffic light label. Why do you think this is? Uh, I think before we go further, we should talk a little bit about calories and energy values. It can be a little bit complicated. Uh, the basic unit is a calorie with a small c. This is a pretty small amount of energy. It's the amount of energy that will raise the temperature of one cubic centimetre of water by one degree centigrade. A more practical unit, from our point of view, is called a calorie, but this time with a capital C. I said it was a bit confusing. It's a thousand calories. So in some cases you'll see this called the kilocalorie but is most often just referred to as a calorie, especially in food labelling. Uh, now, there's also the SI unit, the Joule, and you'll most certainly see this in both in food labels and especially in the scientific literature. Um, it's arguably a better unit, but unfortunately it's not well understood by the general public. For, so for food, we normally use a calorie, again, with an uppercase C. Um, an example which sort of relates to this, back in 2008, Mars fell foul of the UK Advertising Standards Agency after implying that Maltese was a low-calorie snack. Um, a TV advert had two female friends discussing whether the product was a naughty way to enjoy chocolate. Uh, a voice over suggested at least at, le at less than one calorie each, you'll need to find new ways to be naughty. Um, the SA, the Advertising Standards Agency, upheld the claim that the words less than one gave a misleading impression that Maltese was low in energy and changes needed to be made to the advert. Uh, in terms of marketing, why do you think the packet says 190 calories rather than the value in, in kilocalories? The world has moved on since then and this advert would probably contravene recent UK legislation banning gender stereotyping in advertising. Uh, it's quite easy to find product information, so here's a little tutorial for you to do. And we'll probably pause this video, stop this video here, and come back for part B of it. Uh, so go off and have a look at this. It's quite easy to find nutritional information. Just search on the web, uh, maybe in supermarket websites, or in this case, I've just searched for Maltesers Nutrition in a well known search engine. It often produces results you need right at the top of the results page. Uh, the product may be classified as an example of chocolate pouches and bags we note here. Uh, you might want to think about what other ones of those are available. Uh, collect the energy and kilograms information for a range of products. Uh, you may do this as an individual or small group. Uh, we'll probably use this data in various exercises using Excel. Okay, so I'm going to stop this video and I'll be back with the second part shortly.